So, Lord, we do come before you again, Lord, and we thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord, that we can even come under uh, your word, Lord God, that we have been um, uh, saved, Lord God, that the Spirit of God is living within us, and we can um, we can see how important it is to be um, in your proximity, Lord God. So, we think that's a work of the Spirit, Lord. Your word says that it is, and we might, however we're taking that for granted, Lord, you have worked a miracle in our lives that we're even interested in these things. Because uh, man is fallen, Lord, and um, you've done a redemptive work to bring us back. So thank you that the grace has been in our lives to be able to even discern this stuff in Jesus' name. Amen. All right then. So um, we um, have been doing 1 Corinthians, and we are uh, just starting on the next teaching that we're going to do. So just to recap, um, Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, all right, and he's um, he's people are challenging his apostolicity and in future chapters we're going to see him talk about that What's that? <laughs> good evening Brett yeah. um, so Paul's an apostle and he's been sent and um, we talked a little bit about what the apostolic calling is and it's ascending from God um, to the whole body, body of Christ there's gifts in the locality of the, of the body and, um, but the, the apostolic gift is generally not to just one body, even though it would sit in one body. doesn't mean you can detach yourself from everything and be a lone ranger. You've got to be a body life. You've got to be... And, and an apost apostolic person would probably be recognised as an elder. You never know, OK? But, it's, um, but he, his ministry would be to the local body, but also to the wider body. And in, a, in an ideal world... All the ecclesia, the churches around would be saying, hey, come and teach here. But we don't. We've got denominationalism, which anything with ism at the end isn't good when it's to do with church. Um, and it's it, we're all kind of me and mine, us four and no more. You know, we get very territorial about that kind of thing. We don't want to be like that. But then the other side of that coin is, is that what you're letting yourself in for if you just put your arms around the world. You know, because there's all kinds of false teaching out there and all kinds of things that are... There's also good teaching out there. We've mentioned a guy we're going to go and see in a few Sundays time. Might be next week, week after Sunday. Yeah. And uh, so I will definitely and um, um, emphatically want to say to everybody that not everyone's a false teacher, right? There's good people out there. When they do come to Perth, we'll go and see them and we'll go into, under their kind of, you know, we'll expose ourselves to that. So it's not all bad news. There's some great things. God's raised up amazing things in this world. And um, it's just that we live in one of the most isolated cities on earth and no one comes here. Someone told me he lives in Perth. But I'm not sure that's true. Anyway, Rabbi Zacharias. So. Yeah, well, someone said he also lives in Atlanta. So we don't know where he lives. That's Atlanta, basically Atlanta. Yeah, something like that. But anyway, um, so... Paul's the apostle and he's, he's writing to the church at Corinth. We mentioned a little bit about which order of the letters it was. All this doesn't really matter. It's great if you're very interested in you. You want to find out the nuts and bolts of everything. That's like what I do. But what's interesting about this is what's going wrong with it, wrong with this church. Um, how did Paul address it? And how can we stop us becoming what one, you know, Corinth in the, in the problems that they had? Uh, Paul starts to tell us that the problem, uh, the main problem, the first thing he wants to hit is that people are gathering around people and following the people, okay, following the leaders. And uh, chapter one sort of like starts that off, and uh, the second part of chapter one and chapter two hits the nail on the end and said, this wisdom thing, you're doing this thing where you're, you, you, you're acting like the world. If someone says something amazing, you follow them. If someone, uh, it's a bit like today's celebrity cult, isn't it, where somebody's got the right dress on or the right handbag and then the girls if, no, if, you get, if you got um, someone does a great song or a massive rock concert and sells a load of this that and the other next thing you know they get a following because we follow men you know that's a worldly thing and as a Christian if you're living your Christian life right you can I don't think you should follow men but you can have healthy interests in as long as you know toucheth not the unclean thing do you know what I mean there's some things that are obviously not you don't have anything to do with them but you know you can have an healthy interest in things and, and all that and I think only Christians can do it because your first and foremost thing is that you've got your eyes on Jesus all right but um, you know don't have anything to do with this world it doesn't mean hide it means manage things that come your way because otherwise you get a mentality where 
you never see anyone, you never witness to anyone, no one's ever in your orbit so you can be a witness to them and all that because you're, you're scared in this fear. That's not what this is about, okay? It's about having Jesus in your life, he lives in you, you're confident, you, you've risen up to the challenge of living in this world but not being of this world and therefore, you know, you're going to come across, you're going to see things that are unclean and, you know, you don't want anything to do with them, keep a distance. Don't, don't get fearful and hide. Just keep a distance and don't have anything to do with it. You see, what, see the difference? We don't want scared Christians who are fearful of everything in this world, but we also don't want people, and we're going to find out Corinth did this, fully indulged in all the things that were going on uh, around them. And Corinth was filthy. It was you know, really bad. So anyway, chapter 2 goes on about the wisdom of this world. It's not going to help you, you know. But we... Do, however, speak a message of wisdom from among the mature. That's chapter 2, 6. And it goes on to start talking about, you know, the spirit of God's within us. He can He can inspire us and he can He can move us to uh, go into the right um, areas. And then at the end we finished on 2, 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So ignore that. If you're saved, if you're a Christian today... If you're calling upon the name of Jesus, you have the mind of Christ. It doesn't mean you've got the grey matter that he actually had. That's not what it's saying. It's saying you can and have the ability to, um, and I think you were talking about it last week, Helen, when you were talking about tuning in. Brilliant. And Rachel came up with an illustration as well about, um, I can't remember what it was now, but it was tuning in and getting recalibrating and pulling yourself in. And then you can look at this world and you can start to develop a sensitivity for what you're seeing and act upon it. Okay? So this is the wisdom of God coming through your life and you're not just falling on any old kind of sensual you know, driver that some comes, comes before you. And this is what is the problem in Corinth. And it's the problem today. So we're going to talk about it. Now we get to chapter 3. And, um, and I, we had a little bit of a discussion about the um, what's wrong. Why, why do some churches exist and they've got thousands of people in there? And the, the thing is, is that um, the, there's a big crash really and then people go oh you can't say that who are you to say the church might be babyish or infantish they haven't grown up well 1 corinthians chapter 3 brothers i could not address you as spiritual but as worldly that means that's sarkikos sarkikos of the flesh you are of the flesh mere infants in christ there you go paul's saying it i gave you milk not solid food so what do you give babies you give milk. I, I, I don't think there's any pre-food for a baby. I think I think babies immediately get milk, um, one way or another. And um, that's what Paul did. You know, he's giving. He knows that there were babies when he was with them, and he's giving them milk. He's teaching them the very very basics thing, the basic things, to make them grow from the initial stages of newborn to being able to eat solid food, which isn't long after newborn. Estimate it, ladies, when they have babies have solid food. I know it varies, but. Six or eight months. So, as in the natural birth, so the new birth, you can expect somebody to be like a baby when they first get born. Okay, and babies need a lot of nurture. And there's nothing wrong with that. You can get somebody who's a captain of business, somebody who's been a, you know, high up in government or some responsible job. When they become a Christian, it doesn't matter. They're still a baby. Now they might turn around on themselves and go, Ah, but I've been a captain of business and look at my CV. Well, it's nothing to do with that because that's the world. You've accomplished in the world. It's nothing to do with your spiritual kudos. All right. So, and we need to be aware as a group that when somebody comes to us and becomes a Christian, you know, um, or out in your local work or whatever they become a Christian and you bring them to church, then they need a lot of help. You know, and we, we all together need to be mindful of that. And uh, let's not be like some places who enjoy the excitement of pulling somebody over the line and witnessing the new birth seeing the baptism then saying thanks that was awesome we've got our little you know adrenaline shot of aren't we brilliant now we'll leave you alone for the rest of your life and let you just perish and starve to death as a child in a cot somewhere you, you yeah. can sort of cross the line and not and then go back over it in a certain way. no I don't think you can once you're actually saved right and that's and I mean once you are actually saved and that doesn't mean showing an interest in Christ and going to church. And that doesn't even mean showing an interest in Christ, going to church and putting your hand up and saying the sinner's prayer. Because you don't know whether a real conversion's took place. Like I've said, I've said it before in this teaching and in other teachings, is that a lot of people know they need Jesus. 
they just don't want him because what happens is becoming a Christian is knowing you need even if you've got even if you know you need for salvation and you're getting very close if you know you need for salvation and you reach out to the Savior the scriptures tell us that he won't be you know it won't take long for him to grab you if it's genuine but there's also like a because the mark the, the gospel has been marketed right so what happens when you when you get a market when you market something when you market the gospel when you when you, you you're producing a need but it's not always a need that comes from from the heart it can be a, a cerebral need from the mind something that's yeah I know I need to respond to that because it sounds like Jesus has saved the world but the but you, but you only truly come to the come to the Lord again we'll repeat it because it needs saying is when you you are um, implicated by what happened on the cross when you come to a point when you go you know what the Jews killed Jesus the Romans killed Jesus a guy with a hammer and nails killed Jesus I killed Jesus because this had to be the atonement for sin on the cross because of my willful fleshly ways walking away from God law breaking and Jesus had to go to the cross now when you when that's the realization you know you go to God in, with true um, sorrow and true repent some people are very very emotional about that some people it's a it's a internal thing where you go oh oh damn I am I need to do some work with God you know and that's when they get saved so um, again we've touched on the thing of genuine salvation it needs to be and the churches are full of people right of who have put their hand up and said a prayer and and the pastor at the front uh, or whatever he's calling himself these days has said now you say because you said the prayer right wrong that's false teaching there's got to be an inner conversion an inner um, laying down of your life before the creator of all things does that make sense so there's no a oh, whoa, just a minute, please don't. Um, yeah. Has been drip under pressure. An expert. Has been drip under pressure. Anyway, go on. Yeah. Don't call, please don't call me an expert. I'll be ridiculous. Well, um, we've seen a few people who have been watching you say, "Ah, actually, to understand that they've had this transaction." Well, I mean, the thing is, I, I, I've not got a problem saying to people, and it's, um, you know, in the job that we do, it happens, um, it did it quite a lot last year, it's not really happened much this year, but um, there was, you know, people who were saying, I really do want to follow, follow the Lord, and I've made it painstakingly um, obvious, because I do a thing often called the two Adams, and, um, and the, the basic thing is you're born into the first Adam, and this is what... When you took all your smells and bells away and all your jargon and all that kind of thing, this is actually what's happening. You were born into the first Adam. God wants you in the second Adam so that you can be saved, okay? So the first Adam is your natural, but you know, you're born into this world and the sinful nature is passed on by the, the, the man. So therefore, you're born with a sinful nature. At some point, you're going to indulge that sinful nature in sin. So you've got a sinful nature and sinful actions, which, which both break God's law, okay? Now... Jesus comes and deals with the old sin problem and therefore when you um, when you recognize who Jesus is and what he's done is dealing with your sinful nature okay then you can be placed in the second Adam when you come before God in um, sorrowful repentance and say God I need your salvation I need Jesus I want to follow him with the rest of my life and all that now if somebody tells you they've done that and you might want to there's nothing wrong with praying with somebody but what is wrong if you say the prayer is why you're saved? That's not true, okay? Absolutely not true. But you're laying yourself before the Lord, uh, the God of all creation, and saying, I believe that your son was the um, Messiah who came to take away the sin of the world, and I believe that my sin was responsible for putting him on that cross, and my sin needs to be dealt with by this act. It needs to be covered, atoned for. I need to be redeemed, bought back. I need to be ransomed by Jesus and follow him. Now, one of the things what you'll find, and this is controversial because not everyone believes this, is that when somebody is genuinely saved, there is a rising up and desire and a want to want to follow God. And it's insatiable, you can't stop it. Okay, And that's one of the signs. 
there's a natural thing. You don't have to whip it up. You don't have to put a show on or produce an atmosphere or mood music to get someone in the mind space. It's a natural coming up, um, 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 bubbling over by the spirit. And people will be banging down your door to ask you questions about God and to, to, to pursue the Lord. Yeah, and That's the kind of thing what happens. And um, Gary, is that a rule? Does everyone have to be that excited? I'm like, just a minute. The Lord of all creation has just inhabited your heart. You're going to be different. Okay. The Bible says you're going to be different, and um, but you're still a baby. That makes sense. Yep. All right. But just tell them, tell them about the cross. Tell them about the cross and how God, you know, Jesus took away the sins and he died, um, for, you. He died for you. Yeah. It's, it, the good news is very simple. You know, he wants to give you eternal life. He wants to. He's not going. Oh, I'm not sure. He's going. No. I've actually got life and life more abundantly. I've got rivers of you know living water flowing from me. What? And you're all still there going, oh, what do I do? You know, and it's like, come to me, the spirit and the bride say, come. You know, so, we haven't even started this. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. Now, for since there is jealousy and quarrelling among you. Now, I think the King James says, and factions. And factions? And that word is di dicostasia, which is where you get dichotomy or division from. Contrast, you know, that kind of thing. There's jealousy, factions, quarrelling amongst you. So in other words, the body of Christ is really supposed to be in Christ under one head and united by that fact, brothers and sisters, with one living God, okay, are now producing social contracts amongst one another so there's, there's like circles going off over there and following a person a, a person clicks yeah following an idea and it's fragmenting the simplicity of the unity of the body which um who remembers the the teaching what we did on one peter when we're all stones being built together living stones and peter petros the stones he, he was using that thing um for there's jealousy and quarreling and factions amongst you are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? Okay, so mere men. So there's like a, there's an expectation of a Christian to act and be walking out this thing and not acting like the world. Not having jealousy, not having factions and not having quarrelling. Does quarrelling happen in churches? Yeah. But this kind of quarrelling is dividing and it's not being resolved. Okay, do people sin against one another? Yes. Do people say things when the going gets tough and, and misunderstandings and all that? Kind of, yes. But does it get resolved? Yes. In a, in a church that's really growing and people want to really see things happen. In other places, you get so, you know, people get over it and you get like, oh, you, you go and have pizza at someone's house and you start talking, do you hear about what, what Jimmy, is anyone called Jimmy amongst us? Do you know what Jimmy was saying the other day? I don't really agree with, oh, well, we don't agree with it either. You ever been in them situations? And they go, oh, well, you know, we, and then you start getting encouraged because there's another bunch of people who also like pizza listening to your point of view and agreeing with you, right? I've seen it so many times and I've seen the result of it down the line as well. And it's not pretty, right? Then um, you, you might have a little bit of a social function that everyone could, and there's like another family's drawn, and yeah, I don't think Jimmy said that right either. I think there's something going on there. Ooh, you know, and it all starts to become gossip. Next thing you know, you've got like five, six to eight people who are all kind of going, nah, I won't put up with that. Factions. It starts off with a quarrel between Jimmy and person number one, and it grows into a faction because you, you it's grievous, you know, and it's. Biblically, Matthew 18, you go to the person, you say, hey, can I sit down with a coffee? I'm, I'm not sure I'm reading the situation well. Um, the, 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 you know, we could do another talk on uh, how to approach situations like that. But it's always with open hand, okay? And it's always with a hope, open heart and, um, and without you having concluded everything in the absence of truth. You know what I mean? So um, when, we, when we approach an issue like that, it's always like, can I have a coffee with you, please? Because I've got something to say. And it's like, whoa, just a minute. That's not the spirit of unity. You've already somewhere, and you've you've already you're already bitter. You're already <laughs> full of strife and all that kind of thing. It's Sorry. not working well. Eh? Yeah, you've already created your own story. That's it. You've created your own story, and that's judgment because you've not got all the facts. So when you sit down with somebody and you say, "Hey, I'm not really sure I'm reading this well, and I don't want to get in a situation where we are 
you know, having issues. Um, so can we have a coffee? The other person might go, no, we can't. And they've done the same thing. That's another thing, you know. Clearly, we need to sit down with a couple of us, you know. But I, I think, you know, it's been beautiful to be around you guys because there has been some misunderstandings here and there. And you've sat down, had coffee, and then we've all been laughing at the end of it. And um, I know that was when we had wine. No, <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, but um, generally speaking, in all seriousness, we do. You know, it's, we, we think we're growing really well as a group, and um, and people are being biblical in the approach to things. So, how cool is that? Jealousy, quarrelling among you, factions, dichotomy, division. And this is the beginning of the end, really, um, unless it's managed. And Paul's trying to manage it. And what's coming, right, in this letter here, is lots of kind of stuff which came from the fact that they're not one. The, the division, the, 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 if the devil can see cracks in the body, he'll get in there and he'll try and, and he does. And he, he, he's, yeah. And he, he starts to uh, hit away at him. Don't, that's not another reason to get fearful. Oh, the devil's after me. You know the devil's after you. The devil's after you because you're saved. He doesn't want you to be productive. Okay. Are you not acting like mere men? Four. Three, four. For when one says, I follow Paul, and the other, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? All right, so the actual word there is of the flesh. Okay. Again, are you not of the flesh? Well, that's good, yeah, it's alright. It's not what the Greek says, but it's good enough, yeah. Sinful humours of the flesh. Um, what, after all, is Paul, Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants, through whom you came to believe. It seems that these people, right, were, were following the rock stars that led them to the Lord, or baptised them. I said it earlier, remember? I baptised a few of you, but not all of you. And they're all going and rallying around that person. Um, if it's, I don't know what was going on because we, we, we don't really get much insight into this but somebody who's used of the Lord to lead somebody to, to salvation and baptise somebody you know, they're, if they're not in the right place themselves they can see that as a massive green tick from God and it all goes to their head and they all get arrogant and prideful and, um, and that can be a problem as well so it's not just the followers, it's the leaders as well but we'll see this in a minute um after all, what is Apollos and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned each to his task. So people got different gifts, you know this. Um, each person has a different task. If you don't know what it is yet, then that's all right, don't panic. Okay, We're all doing well without you. <laughs> but, um, but, but you know, we, as, as I've said, and we will get to that in 12 to 14, um, chapters 12 to 14 we're going to start going on gifts and you finding out what our gift is and stuff and what we can how, how do we contribute to the body you know this body here six three six i planted the seed so paul planted this church okay and he's using gardening as a illustration i planted the seed apollos watered it but god made it grow okay so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. So in other words, when um, there's some people in this room know what it's like to sit with less than even what we've got tonight and that that was church for a long time, you know, and the, my heart's cry and I think the cry of other people was, God, you're obviously not making this grow. And I have to, I have to agonise and go, should I be doing this, you know? And then probably two years ago, you know, we started to see some movement and, and the Lord has really grown. Um, but I don't mean just numerically because it's been a bit numerically but it's been also depth there's been people there's been healings amongst us there's been people pr being prophetic there's been um, people praying and they, they don't even know what they're saying because they spot on what they're saying and it starts to move into from being Lord and it starts to be pro proclamation of what's actually going on and people are like oh that's speaking into my heart and all that kind of thing and there's been things that have gone on um, amongst us and all that and that's really cool to um see and and that's the that's growth you know so if you think of growth somebody once said in america they've had a revival uh, a thousand miles wide and one inch deep you know what i mean so god's not going to just make millions of people become christians and just leave them to it because they've got no resource to for the depth but if you've got 15 to 20 people in a room and they're all growing in the lord that's a beautiful thing and we used to say this i think because there were only a few of us if you've got, you know, in the last days, it'll be like Noah, you know, 
and um, so you've got there are only eight people on the ark if you've got more than eight people you're doing well you know what I mean and if you've got more than 12 you're doing better than Jesus <laughs> so I mean you know that's a bit of a flippant way of saying it but you know be, be rejoice because of the family that he's put around you and um, and you know I think the Lord's going to continue to grow what we're doing um, in this group Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. I think that's a lot of people. Uh, so number eight three eight, the man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded. That word there is misthos, and it's kind of the thought of wages. But the reward here, the the, the idea with misthos is that it's. It's not that you're just going to get good rewarded, rewarded well. It's also with the the element that you will lose. You can lose it for bad kind of thing. You know, the reward isn't like if if you're on twenty dollars an hour, right? Then you won't get the full week's wage if you don't do every, everything that the boss said. Do you know what I mean? It's that kind of thing. Have you ever skived off for an hour or half an hour? Have you ever skived off work? You still get paid because no one knows you're scared off work. Unless you tell them and you're a bit daft, like, you know, so like. Mm. So, and if Michelle's listening to this, who's the manager of some people in this room, don't, you know, don't make a sound. Any any people who work for Michelle, n- not a sound. <laughs> right, so. <laughs> or laugh loudly or anything. Right, so. Um, <laughs> so, but you still get paid. But this is like, you'll get rewarded for what what's happening. And it does explain this. Uh, it introduces the rewards theme. So he gets a rewar- uh, reward according to his own labour. For it, we are all God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Okay. So um, there's a few illustrations there. God's field um, um, to, to sow into. God's building to build up. Paul's saying, he's on this theme of, of the temple, the, 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 the building, something being built, started, and someone's building on that thing. And here we go, 10. By the grace... By the way, not gift. God has given me. I laid a foundation as an expert builder. And someone else is building on it. So Paul started the work. And another continues the work in his absence. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. So, number one, there's a foundation already laid at the time of writing. Paul somehow knew that there was something that's that's set in place a foundation and it's possible to try and build with a different kind of thing so even in that day people are trying to build people are trying to set something off which is um, not quite of the Lord and this whole theme of following men is taking the church off in another direction that's not intended so when he says the foundation um, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. The foundation of any church that's built and, and started by God is he is the foundation of that church. And it's not like Paul comes in, starts plants the church, Apollos comes in and, and, and does more work, starts to build it and all that, and then they become the one. Do you see what I mean? It's not there. They're not the foundation. Paul's not the foundation of this church. It's Jesus Christ. So why are you following him? Apollos isn't the one who's, even though he's building it, don't put your eyes on him. It's Jesus who started this church. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. So this thing, this little saying there was the day, which is the day of the Lord, where there's going to be a judgment for Christians. Did you know that? There's going to be a judgment for all Christians, but it's not a judgment to condemnation or even getting told off. But um, somebody put it like this. Um, you've got, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, and you've got gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw in a bag, and you put it on a fire, what will be left? But what will be left if you put all, all a bag of all what's there, gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, which is going to burn up? Hay and straw. The wood, hay and straw. What's going to be left? 
the silver, gold and the stones. So basically, we will go before the Lord. And I don't think you'll have a bag full of stuff because he's going to tell you in a minute that you are the temple. So this will happen within you. Okay? If you through your life are built with wood, straw and um, hay, is it? And you get before the Lord, he's going to burn up all the things that were of man, all the things that were your own works, all the things that were not of him and it just belongs to this world. But gold, silver and costly stones... All right, the things of heaven, the things that are valuable, you know, and then will be left. So say, for instance, you become, you do what we are doing and we're starting to do an authentic, you know, bib, what we call, bib, what I call biblical church. And we're trying to do it according to the scripture. And you do it for 20 years and a few hundred people get saved and move on and stay with you, whatever. And then at the end of that 20 years, it turns out that you start to, you know, get a little bit of like fall in love with yourself again and you start to do all these things which are self-serving and um, do all these things that are actually looking towards yourself and trying to, you know, muscle in on the act because Paul's saying there's one foundation, it's Jesus Christ but if I start, if I start to, um, you know, like blow my own trumpet and say, oh, look at this church that we started, you da, know, da, 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 all that kind of, then uh, me and me and a guy I work with, Ross, he, he, we said, wouldn't it be funny, as, as, as you was living your Christian life, it was like an app, right, and when you gained a reward, you heard a ping, like that, and when you lost one, you heard a kind of thing, like, and as, through the day, all you were hearing was ping, 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 you know, so, 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 so you're going, no, start the rewards, we're going. but anyway, it doesn't even work like that, but I just thought it was funny what we said that, but, if you start, you know, uh, fall in love with yourself um, and start saying, oh, look at this and writing books about how brilliant you are, then that could risk, because no one, I can't judge someone on that, but it, you could risk the fact that God's like going, you know, that you know, you know some of the gold, silver and costly stones now, you're chucking a bit of wood and hay and stubble in it. That's not, you, that's not used to me. You started off really well. You, 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 I was the foundation, I was the centre and the focus of everything that we were doing. You were submitted, yielding and abandoning and telling others to do that and teaching others to do that. You were doing all this, then suddenly it became about you again. Burn, baby, burn. Disco inferno, burn, baby, burn. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. Because, uh, but some people never some people never get beyond that. You, you t I, I don't know, I can't. I look at some things and I go, if, if we are true in what we think here, and that there is a blueprint for church where you're supposed to come and um, uh, meet in small groups in homes around a covenant meal and uh, there's no hierarchy amongst us we're all brothers and sisters even though we've all got different gifts and all that kind of thing um, and some people will be doing different things than you then you know we're trying to do that and all what that facilitates is that that's a wine skin but God's trying to produce the wine so I can tell you about what church should be like the the wine skin and that needs to be said these days but what we want to be looking at is what's the wine, the sweet, aromatic, beautiful bouquet of God's grace and mercy amongst us flowing, you know, like, like, um, do you get it? Wine? It's like that kind of thing. Um, amongst us. And, um, and that's the kind of thing where, you know, we really want to, want to get that going. So there, if there is a, a pattern, if there is a blueprint for church and people are doing the other thing and doing their version of church because history has dictated what they do and they're not really thinking biblically and they've never even considered that there might be a blueprint for church in the first century that should never have changed you know and it's simple church where god can have uh, access to people and people can have access to god more freely and where there's less likelihood i'm not saying no likelihood of false teaching where there's you know that you, you you feel more safe because you're not fostering all this rank and file and all this kind of factions and all this kind of thing and and what happens to them people who've just gone down that route burn baby burn <laughs> disco inferred i don't know you don't know but what I, what i know is that if we're right if if we're doing something which is you know led on the foundation of christ and the words that he said this do in remembrance of me then um you know i feel i'm fearful for the um, for the bonfire and um yeah. But how do you get that? I mean, the, we're all striving because we're all full of defects and, and faults and 
Yeah, so, so we've got our personal walk where we falter, trip and fail, okay? And we can come back in repentance. When you falter, trip and fail and come back in repentance, then you are being faithful to God's command because he said repent and follow Jesus. So that's a lifestyle of repentance. This context, what we're talking about, and this is really going to rule what, we, what we're thinking now. The context here is building. He's talking about building the church. You know, because Corinth was a church that Paul planted, and now somebody else is growing the church. But these infants, they won't grow up. They refuse to grow up. They won't become wise. They're still at a baby stage. Okay. So um, the whole context of what's being seen, it's, uh, said here is about partaking in something that's growing biblically a church that's growing biblically and um, the, these um, if a man builds on this foundation uh, using gold, silver and costly stones, wood, hay or straw his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light it will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each man's work that's why I'm saying burn baby burn right so it will be tested with, the, the, with fire and, and what will remain after that burning experience right, will be what you're rewarded for. So it should leave us quite, ooh, what, what's going on there? So if you're, if you're part of a church that's trying to be biblical and trying to do it through the scriptures, then thank God that he's given you eyes to see. You know? and, um, and then I guess after that it is about you know, trying to walk well and all that kind of thing. And um, trying, to, trying to be like Jesus. Good luck with that. Um, 14. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burnt up, he will suffer loss, and he himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. The suggestion here is that there's a person like that, and he will get before the Lord, and the Lord will, will um, look at the work that he's done, and then some people, well, everything will be burnt up, and only themselves will be saved. And there'll be little reward for them, but they'll come through the flames, just kind of like, oh, what did I do in my life? You know, and you've, I don't know, I've seen Christians who have made a commitment and have seen fruit, and then suddenly they're just not doing anything. They never really get into their calling, and it's always wandering around the desert, going past the same cactus like Scooby Doo, every like, you know, so often. Yeah, like you've seen it here, everyone's got a role. Everyone's got a role, okay? And if your role is to be hospitable on a Sunday and uh, turn up and just, you know, faithfully gather with brothers and sisters to encourage and build up the fellowship and that's what your gift and calling is for life, then you've been fulfilled and you'll get your full reward. If you're like Billy Graham or this Reinhard Bonke guy, and I saw another uh, video the other day, uh, 949,000 people were in the crowd. This is, in Africa. this is in Africa, yeah. He used to have the biggest tent on earth and the biggest speaker system on earth. And um, and they, they talk to people and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people come forward for salvation. You know, and um, if Re if Reinhard Bonnke gets before the Lord and he's done what Jesus has asked him to do, and he he'll get his reward, and the the person who's been faithfully attending the church because that's all they had to do will get the same reward. And how do you know you're doing the right what you should be doing? Well, I mean, I think the Lord's gracious. It's like it's like people, you know. We, um, I'm, I had a bit of a facetious joke with the burn baby. But I don't know what God's going to do, but if somebody's in a in a church system and they genuinely don't know any different, and they attend it and they keep doing what they're doing, and they don't know any different to what church should be, then they're being faithful to what they know, to the to the scope of what they know. So I don't know what's going to, you know, it's that kind of thing. I think the Lord's much more gracious than my thinking. We think black and white. The Lord's got all kinds of, you know, in this respect, graces and mercies all the way through it, and um, that's why we, we shouldn't ever be, you know, if we've been on a trajectory towards biblical church and you know trying to push on something which is in the Lord's heart to do, then we should never become elitist or arrogant about it because oh my goodness, that's just ridiculous, isn't it? But if you've got that many people, right, and you're saying so many. Well, this was a problem for Billy Graham, wasn't it? So Billy Graham, I'm still speaking to people today who said, oh, I got saved at a Billy Graham crusade. And I'm like, brilliant. 
right? So, uh, but they're two percent who are still going on now of the ones that got. So only two percent came through and actually continue with the Lord. So the question that in the final reckoning, as you say, yeah. you know, feed them the milk. Yeah. Who's do, see, This is the, this is the thing. So it's confusing, mm-hmm. and um, and and uh, if you don't want to be confused, don't think about it. But the thing is, is is someone said to me the most important thing in the world is evangelism I said I can agree with you and I, I waited enough pause for them to go oh great and then I went to an extent because God would he save a lot of newborn babies to send them into a um, spiritual abattoir no but so what happens is I'm as passionate probably a little bit more passionate these days about what the facilities like, the, the families are like, that, that save people go into, mm-hmm. than the fact that the lost get saved. Because I, I haven't got responsibility for any of them things. You know, you, you can't make one person get saved. You can't do it. You know, so you can't make anything come alive again. You just can't. It's God's will and purpose. You're just invited on the trip. You're just invited on the journey of that person you, 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 we're honoured and privileged to be part of mi- being ministers of reconciliation but who's doing the reconciling? God Okay. so how people get saved is not in my hands but I'm happy to be part of that process and what they get saved into is a little bit part of what we're doing because we want to provide nurturing families who can handle newborn babies and you know um, and not mishandle them so that's you know and my my prayer is people get saved because I want the lost to be saved I've got like a knowledge of what being lost is and, and eternally lost is unthinkable right but then we've got to we've got to make a facility where we can care for people and uh, the trouble is with house groups right and I don't think it's the trouble with ours but if you don't if you don't watch it you can be very much a holy huddle and you get used to each other and it's brilliant you have a lovely little family that God wants to be massive but it just remains little because you, you know but I'll always be well I say you know, with the Lord's will I'll always be around to, to break that stereotype and say come on let's start talking to our workmates let's start you know being open and, and saying to God in the morning I can't save anyone but you can turn you know give me opportunities to speak to people create divine appointments I don't like the phrase but it's there divine appointments for us to um, gossip the gospel and to to live it out and let people ask questions yeah that's what a witness is and everybody in this room um, is a witness not everyone's an evangelist or anything but you're all a witness when required to be okay and you're on jury service tomorrow and for the rest of your life just thought I'd tell you anyway um, anyway oh wait a minute jury service isn't a witness is it it's a completely different thing, so scrub that. Right, um, so, if what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. So if you've got uh, costly, costly stones and gold and silver, some people say that gold's the picture of the Father, silver, the Son, and the costly stones, the Holy Spirit, I don't know. I've never, I don't really buy into that stuff. But it's a nice illustration, just to, just to tell you what it is. I personally think that that list there is the is the is the temple's um, the temple's constitution constitutional parts gold silver costly stones wood and straw it was made out of that stuff um, if it's burnt up he will suffer loss he himself will be saved but only as one escaping through the flames so in other words what you do and what you build and your reward is not anything to do with the intrinsic value of you to God you are much more valuable than the work that you do. I'll say that again. You are much more valuable to God than the work that you do. All right? He doesn't. He, he wants to use you, but not at the expense of you. He doesn't want to burn you out into the ground, so that you're just crawling. I thank you, Jesus, for using me for the last five years. Let me die in peace. You know, it's like it's not like he wants you to have a healthy, lovely, balanced life and try and be a witness for him. Okay. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and God's spirit lives within you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. Now, when we read this, we've got to look at context. Because everyone takes that verse out and says, if you smoke, if you drink, if you eat red meat, 
if you breathe oxygen you're gonna die god's gonna destroy you because you're enjoying life way too much you know what i mean because your temple you're destroying the temple that's you yeah so why would paul suddenly pull out this couple of verses from talking about building temples and building and, and rewards and suddenly start telling you about yeah, you better start you know living well because you'll just you know it's not what's being said here and besides where is it in the gospel of jesus christ that if you go on a season of sin then god's going to destroy you it's the opposite message god loves you and he wants to restore the sinner and he wants the person to come to him and blessed are those who mourn for they will be beaten senseless no comforted god's the comforting god and he's not there waiting with a baseball bat for you to smoke a cigarette don't smoke cigarettes by the way but just just an illustration right um he's not there you know with a boxing gloves on going he's gonna have that extra glass of wine you know what i mean it's like don't have the you know do everything with thanks not smoke i'll take drugs right just don't do that with thanks that's not good there's things that are not good anytime right but in the normal course of life all right if you're doing it with faith and thanks to god enjoy it if it starts to enjoy you a bit too much that's when you've crossed the line if we're doing it as a crutch as a prop and we might have some of them things in our life because we're all ordinary human beings let's get before god and, and lay them before him and say god i think that's gone too far now i'm actually leaning on I don't know, chip butties too much, I don't know. What do people, I, mean, I don't want to show of hands, but you know, there might be some things in the room. So, so, so as long as we know we've got a part to see, we've got a part to see, we know we've got a part to see, that we do, that it's a sin, or we feel it's a sin, um, we just don't beat ourselves up too much about it. Obviously, depending on sin, but you know, um, you go. You expect. You know that your holy father wants to forgive you, so you know. And then repent and yeah, keep your account short because I mean, and and then you know, make sure that when you, when you go to God and you truly have exposed everything before Him and said I'm as law breaking fool as you knew when you first saved me, and I'm not much different than that. I'm still a law breaking fool. I'm still enjoying sin, and I'm disgusted at that. But the point is, is that. You know, the other side to that coin is grace and mercy increase unto your, your law breaking. So you've got like, you know, a season of sin or whatever, and you go before God and say, Well, that wasn't great, was it? And I'm broken and I'm snot and tears and all that kind of thing. God will be there to forgive you without a shadow of a doubt. Because that act of recognizing law breaking and the act of bringing it before God and saying, God, I render this up to you, is God's will and purpose for your life. Okay? God smiles when we go, I'm a sinner and I'm sick of it and I'm tired of the whole thing and I need God, he's driving me mad, I need you to just drill this out of my life. God's got a smile on his face because he goes, that's my will as well. And now you're more aware of my will through sin, you know. But that doesn't mean going, you know, going sin a lot because then God will be more smiley face because you've come back. That's a, not a right way of thinking. But the wrong way of thinking is thinking you've sinned, God's there, he's took his glasses off like I've threw him on the desk, he's, his arms are folded and he's kind of looking at you going, you again. Have we got any lightning here or thunder or anything, that's earthquakes or plagues for this person? No, Jesus shed his blood so that it's the opposite response. The wrath is gone and now it's grace and mercy and it's peace. And um, that's what we—that's what we can. And we've got to re, re, retrain our brains that that's what's actually going on in our repentance. So, what is going on here? Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, and God's spirit lives in you? So basically, you—you're not actually going to be bringing gold, silver, costly stones, wood, earth, straw in front of Him. You're not going to have the constitutional parts of a temple. You yourself will be in front of Him. Okay, and. Um, and that's what will be appearing before God. You are God's temple. God lives in you. Okay, It's not just a dwelling place. So do take note of this. It, you're not God's house or his caravan or his, you know, like um, camping equipment somehow, like the tabernacle was. You are his temple. So while we're, we're not being, I don't think we're being facetious about sin at all, but just remember that the, the temple is holy. Okay? And we've got a try and live up to that holiness that's been um, that's been given us
17 if anyone destroys god's temple god will destroy him right destroy there is the wrong word it's defile for theorio defile spoil ruin defile spoil or ruin so you're defiling the temple when you build with another foundation when you so what is it called there's one word in every single case when you put something before god what's it called idolatry, idolatry. okay what these people are doing is they're putting people, the followership of people, before the followership of Jesus Christ, who is the foundation. Okay, And therefore, if you defile the temple, because in your heart, if you decide that you're going to follow a man and not keep your eyes on Jesus and all that kind of thing, and that's, there's a lot of that around today, then you've defiled the temple because you've placed a man in front of God and that's what I call mediator is substitution you've put somebody as a mediator in, in, you know even to a, even when you start doing it you'll get a check from the Holy Spirit don't follow men that's not going to work well is everyone getting this is this yeah but then worryingly it says God will defile him now I know people now I can't say that this is exactly what's going on here because I find that very chilling indeed if you defile God's temple, if you go and place idols, and it's unrepentantly, you know, you think this is the right thing to do uh, before God, then God will defile you. In other words, did we not see it in the first chapters of Romans about the ones who continued and wanted and taught and went on with a downward spiral? There, God just went, right, passive judgment. You carry on on the downward spiral. I can't do anything with it. And I think that this is what this means. God will defile them. In other words, if you want to continue following men, enjoy it because there's nothing I can do about it you're putting a man before God for God's temple is sacred and you are that temple 18 do not deceive yourselves if any of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this in this age he should become a fool so that he'll become wise okay um, so basically don't try to um, build into yourself all a way of thinking where you reckon that you've got worldly wisdom and it's going to work this way. In other words, just push that whole scaffolding down, walk away from it, and become foolish in the eyes of the world. And that's what it requires to really follow Jesus. To become like a fool. In the eyes of the world, you're not a fool. <laughs> you know what I mean? In that sense. You're actually God's possession is, is dearly beloved child. But in the eyes of the world, they'll go, you're a fool because you're putting all your eggs in the basket of a of a ghost, somebody you can't see, who died on a tree. It's all about blood, and man, a dead Jew comes alive again, and and people spew up, get spewed up on a beach, and the waters part, and the, you know, are you stupid or something? You fool, you know. Become a fool, become like a child in your thinking, not infant, not this way, but just in your thinking. Get rid of the frameworks of human wisdom and just say, God, give me your biblical wisdom. Give me the wisdom of Christ. Give me the mind of Christ. Who, you know, was God and allowed himself to be nailed to a stump somewhere in Israel. 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. Yeah? As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about men. Right, so he's still on this subject. Yeah, it's all been about this subject of your following men. Don't go with human philosophy, human wisdom. Because it's not godly wisdom. Don't follow men. Don't build on anything but Jesus Christ. Don't divert onto some kind of church-splitting quarrel, jealousy, or anything like that just to make yourself feel better and appeal to you, the sensualities of life like um, which also include being right have you ever met somebody who just wants to be right I have me right but I'm trying not to be like that okay have you ever met somebody who just wants to make it that everyone looks at them as if they've got like all the knowledge and all the wisdom right that's not great but it's a sensuality for a person they can sit there and go great I've got the respect and honour of, of people around me you know and they sit there and that's not great tip it all away give give other people accolades 
And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile, so they're no more boasting about men. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours, and you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. All things are yours. It means, it, it means that if you can get away from, from having these eyes on men, following all these leaders, you, you can become free. And somebody who's free is entitled to everything. And that's what's being said. You're only binding yourself up again into some kind of um, you know, like, um, social contract, which will only lead to being um, bound and going down a cul-de-sac. Now, I'm going to stop it there. Okay, pro approximately an hour into this, that's good. Any questions on this teaching tonight? So um, the next chapter kind of unpacks that last bit of it about being foolish and all things are yours and all that. I uh, don't really want to go into it now because we'll do it next week. But uh, Father, we do thank you for this. Uh, we thank you for each and every person who's um, um, coming among our small ecclesia, Lord. And uh, we do pray for those who can't be here tonight, Lord, that they will be blessed, Lord, and we can somehow get this media to them. Um, and as we take our weary bodies home tonight give us all a uh, good night's sleep Lord and thanks for everyone coming out Lord on this Thursday night and um, I pray Lord that this word will be sealed in hearts and minds Lord God and you'll bring it to their recall uh, when appropriate in the name of Jesus Amen